the light patch in the AOV widget update 4 has released, and I wanted to go over the new features and how they affect your renders. I recorded this scene from start to finish with as little cuts as I could so you could get a full preview of working with the tool. So we're in a scene. First thing I'm going to do is turn down my scalability settings. This is because the scene I'm rendering has a lot of fur. If you don't have the scalability options at the top of your scene, you can go to the settings and it's there as well. We'll be going over this a bit more later on. So we're going to search for our render passes widget folder and then inside that folder, go into the render passes tool folder. Here we'll have a copy of the tool. Right click on the tool and click run editor widget. I have a separated underscore old copy here as this was his test scene for the new tool. If you are using Mac, make sure to use the tool inside the Mac OS folder. Once the tool is up, we want to start with our presets, since this will save us time from having to manually set up our settings every single time. I'm going to go inside the preset folder to create a new preset. Right click and search for data asset. Then select the BP presets. Because I have multiple in this file, I'm just going to duplicate the demo sec preset. Either way will work to create a new preset. I'm going to go ahead and name the preset and then give it an underscore pass afterwards. This will help us stay organized with our render passes per shot. We're going to pull up the preset and first thing we want to do is add our sequence. An easy way to find the sequence you're in is click this film clapper button under the target sequence and that will add the currently open sequence. Then you can click the folder button beside it and that will take you to the sequence in your content browser. Add the sequence to our preset and then we'll move on to the render options section. One of the first things you'll see is a new dropdown for render modes. We have a bunch of new render options you can render in. Raster Render has been renamed to Deferb, which is a more appropriate naming for rendering with the base engine in Unreal. For this project, we're going to be rendering with path tracing so we can show off some of the new path tracing AOV options later on. Going down the list, the next option is for a custom playback range. This is good if you want to render a select range per shot or do test renders. We have resolution presets underneath. If you go to the documentation, there's a section there to explain how to add your own custom presets. I'll also be releasing a video on that as well soon. If you wanna put in your own custom presets within the tool, just make sure the custom preset is selected. Next, we have a new option in 4.0, which is override existing output. Turning this off will make sure that if you're rendering in the same folder, it won't override your current file space and instead add a number to your namespace. Underneath, you'll see a new file type drop down. You now have more options to render different file types. Uh, moving down, you will have compression type. This will make sure your files aren't too large. I would recommend you use a lossless file compression like zip 16. If you're rendering in a large resolution, I would highly recommend you compress your files as it can lead to instability in Unreal Engine. Underneath is the output path. Now I've seen some issues in the past where the tool can have trouble with poor match strings in the output path. So I'm asking not to put them in the output path, but we have created a new option down in the utility section to help with namespace and folder structure. You'll see some new options like output append and file name. In output append, you can put your format strings to create new folder with data from Unreal. I've also added three new options below where you can add your own format strings, pass name, sequence, and shot name. You can add a sequence name of chip and a shot name of YouTube. I will also add a pass name of chipmunk this one will be important. I can change the sequence name format string to just sequence and it will pick up the sequence option. We're also going to add a slash pass name to the output append and a dot pass name to the file name append. This will make sure you're getting the inputted name from the pass name section. You can also just manually put the pass name in as well. If you want to know all the format strings, you can go to the utility section in the tool and click on the format strings button. This will open a Google Doc with a list of all usable format strings. And if you scroll to the bottom, you'll see the three custom format strings. The tool has a lot of new buttons in the UI that are there to lead you to tutorials or docs that can assist you with the tool or your renders. Let's go now to samples. Here we can adjust the quality of our renders, use temporal samples for motion blur renders, and spatial samples for still renders. This scene has a lot of motion blur from the chip mount running, so we're going to set a good amount of temporal samples. In my other tests, 32 was a good number, but in your renders, make sure you test before you commit. We can also go over the scalability here we adjusted earlier. You'll see on the chipmunk a really harsh shadow screen left side. This is because we aren't getting any bounce lighting from the environment light. In order to see that, we would have to switch from scale our scalability settings from high to cinematic. Now, sometimes Unreal will change the scalability for you in heavy scenes and make sure you can view the content. But to make sure you are rendering at the highest scalability for all these settings and other hidden settings, you want to use the cinematic quality settings. 
Now, if you're running a large team with a large resolution, lots of grooms, assets, complicated light setups, you may have issues rendering with cinematic quality settings. That could result in very slow renders, crashes, or your render taking forever to start. If that's the case, you may want to test with the cinematic quality settings off to see if that's the issue. If it is, you can turn it back on and then use console variables to override some of the scalability settings to get your scenes to a renderable level. I'm going to leave the rest of the quality settings alone and I'll go to my color. I have an OCIO config the dev sequence in here and I'll leave that so I can render in ACES linear format. If you want more info on the color settings and management, you can check out this video. Moving on to our AOVs, I have render BP lights selected, but since I have no blue current lights in this scene, I'll turn that off and remove the BP lights. We're going to keep light groups on so we can render our light passes and then go ahead and set up our light groups. We have a skylight for the environment. We're going to give it the actor tag ENV2. This will make sure it renders in the ENV group for any other lights that have ENV actor tags. And then the directional light, which is our sunlight, we're going to give the actor tag sun2. You'll notice the sun is a spawnable light. Spawnable lights are now supported in the tool. Additional info will be in the tool documentation link in the description. There's also a new option called Auto Light Tags that will assign the name of your lights to the actor tag. This works for all lights except skylight and BP lights. We're going to uncheck our emissive path and then we can see our option to add additional light AOVs. The views and spec will give info on direct diffuse and spec on deferred renders. Roughness will give reflective material values for deferred renders. But since we are running with patch tracer, we don't need this as there is a new option for under advanced, we can do emissive overrides on specific materials. So if you have emissive passes on and you can't add an emissive tag to the actor, you can override by the emissive material. The material will still need the emissive pass pump parameter multiplied at the end of your setup, just as before. Other new options are the tech primary override. This makes it so you don't have to render your tech AOVs in a separate pass and they can be rendered instead with your primary pass to save time on an additional render. You can check it on and then make sure disable tech pass is on. It will take the AOVs that are checked off and render it with the quality settings of your primary pass. I'm gonna go ahead and select the ones I need and also create a camera depth pass. And then I'll go ahead and add it to my camera so I can adjust my values. Once adjusted, I'll take my custom tech AOV and make sure render 32-bit is checked off. This is only an option in Unreal 5.5. The next option is ID primary override, and this will allow you to render a crypto ID with your primary in case you don't want to render separate crypto passes or if you want a fourth crypto ID. Next on the list is another new feature, Pass Tracer AOVs, and now the tool will automate the creation of light component VAs like direct and indirect diffuse spec emission and volume passes. Just select render lighting AOVs. I don't have an emission in this scene, so I'm going to turn off direct emission. And then to show off one of the biggest new features of the tool, I'm going to save the preset and go to the tool. I'll the preset into the tool, you can see all the settings have been filled out. Then I'm going to go up to the top and instead of clicking render, I'm going to click this new option called Batch to MRQ. Then I'll go and open the Movie Render Queue. The movie Render Queue always creates a new job when you open, so I'll delete that one as it's not needed. You can see all of the jobs the tool automated inside the Movie Render Queue. And if we select the config, we can see all the settings we adjusted in the tool in the Movie Render Queue. If we go to the output, you'll see the output path and file name format included the strings we put in. This will allow us to render and name multiple passes or layers for a shot. Now we're going to go behind the scenes here a little bit and I'll show you what the tool is doing and how it's overriding the lights and light AOVs in each of these passes. If you look at the right, you'll see a new sequence with a name different from the target sequence we're in. We'll click into one of these sequences and you'll see that environment light is disabled in the sequencer, but the distance light is visible. If we go to the camera component, you'll see that only direct diffuse is active. If we set the camera and go down to the path tracer options, you'll see that the tool has automatically adjusted these light components to match the pass. So if we go to path tracer viewport, you'll see that only the direct diffuse is rendering. To show another pass, we can go to the sun indirect specular and click into the sequencer. We'll click at the top to change the viewport to path tracing 
and you'll see the indirect specular from the sunlight. This is what we'll render in the sun indirect specular pass. If we go back to our main sequence and look at the camera, we'll see that nothing has been changed and we're working non-destructively. We're going to do some adjustments now, but one thing you can do with the MRQ is save the queue in case you want to pull it up again. So we're going to go into the object visibility section now. We want to render the chipmunk in forest separately so we can have greater control and comp. We have three options for object visibility, hide actors, turn primary visibility off, and hold up. We're going to be using the primary visibility off section. Turning primary visibility off will make the object visibility off to the camera, but keep secondary visibility for shadow casting and indirect lighting. You'll see options here. You can manually add the actors or add by tag. So we're going to give all of our forest actors an actor tag. We can name environment or set or layout. We'll stick with layout and then I'll add layout to the add trace actors by tag option. I also want to hide the height field fog actor, so I'm going to add it to the hide actor section. If you're using the main tool, you can add these actors manually, but it doesn't work in the data assets. So if you're going to be using the presets, you'll need to add them by tag. So add a fog actor tag to the hide field fog and then add that tag to the add excluded actors by tag option. Going to the utility section, we skipped over one of the new options, which allows you to change your frame handle in case you want to do retiming in post. We still have the movie graphs options if needed, and it does work with the bastard MRQ feature as well. We'll save the preset and close it down. We'll then duplicate the preset and name it to forest pass. Inside the preset, we'll change the object visibility from layout to chip and assign that to the chipmunk blueprint. We will then go into the blueprint and give the same tag to the components. This way the tool can access them. We'll also need to change the pass name in the utility section to forest. That way our proper folders will be created. We'll save the preset and load it into our tool. We'll then patch it to the MRQ and look at what happens. As you can see, the chipmunk and all of the grooms and components inside the blueprint are hidden. We can now see as the timeline moves the shadow of the chipmunk running up the tree. So the tree is still affected by the chipmunk, but the chipmunk is not visible to the camera. The same thing happens when we change the viewport to pass tracing. We'll head back to the main sequence and I'll add my next pass for the fog. In the fog pass, I'm going to take out the primary visibility tags and add both layout and chip to the holdout section. I'll then remove the fog from the excluded actors and I'll adjust the name. I'm going to remove the light groups and crypto. I'll go into the tech AOVs and remove world normal and world position as I only need the camera depth AOV. I'll save the pass, exit, and then duplicate the fog pass to create my final pass. This will be to cut out the chipmunk from the forest so we can get a clean merging positing. I'll rename the preset to cut out, and in this one, I'll remove the tech AOVs and again, just render primary. I'll go into the holdout section and I'll make sure the chip are in the add holdout actors by tag option. I will then go and put the hide field fog back into the hide actors section. Then in the utility section, I will change the pass name to cut out. I just realized I forgot to name the fog pass, so I will go back and do that now. Save both those presets. Now there are a couple ways I can go about rendering these passes. I can add them all one by one to the patch to MRQ section. There I save a queue for passes and render them with the movie render queue. On doing this, I just realized I forgot to take light component AOVs off of the cutout and fog passes, so I will quickly go back and do that now. Once that is done, I'll one by one add my preset to the movie render queue with the batch to MRQ option. First, we'll add our cutout. Then I want to go into the cutout sequence and make sure that the holdout is working. We can see the chipmunk matted in the scene, giving us a good alpha to merge and nuke. I'll then add my other passes in. On adding them, I realized I accidentally adjusted the forest and not the fog pass, so I'll go fix that. That's the good thing about batching to MRQ is it gives you a second chance to check your renders before rendering and avoiding mistakes. It also shows you how easy it is to make adjustments in the tool. After adjusting, I'll add those two passes back into the tool. You'll see them listed here. We're going to go ahead and delete those passes. Instead, we're going to show the batch render feature. So if you want to just load these presets up, and have them render sequentially with level-based adjustments instead of sequencer overrides, we can use the batch render option. 
I'll click on the batch button here to see the batch render UI. You'll notice at the top that the batch render button is faded out despite having all our settings filled out. Well, this is because it's not activated. If we click the batch render button, it will light up. And then we just need to add our presets here. We can adjust version number here so we don't have to adjust them inside the presets every time. And once we're set up, I can hit render and we'll render all of the passes created in these presets one after the other. So I'll do that and leave my computer to render. Those are the newest updates in the tool. There'll be some small patch updates for the UI and other features, but it's been quite a big overall. New features include spawnable light support, new file save options, increased object visibility controls, full blueprint light support, light component AOVs for path tracing and batch rendering support. The main focus of this update was on layer rendering. All of these features assist in helping you easily render in layers, which gives you more control over complicated render setups. As always, if you have any questions, you can drop them below or join their Discord. If you're interested in this tool, it's available on the Fab Marketplace. Link is in the description.